Hello and welcome to the second of my videos on film acting and this one will take us from the talkies up through method acting and so you might remember that last time we were looking at silent films and how by the time of the 1920s certainly by the 1920s we had a huge market for film this was a big industry we had stars we had international markets largely because you didn't have the spoken word and you can simply change out title cards from one language to another and a certain method of acting had emerged as well a certain grammar of film had emerged as well where we had the close-up finally not just the tableau like full screen character and I wanted to share with you a picture of a movie theater this one really a Nickelodeon so we're talking about 1910 and you can see at the front underneath the cowboy that there is already a bit of an orchestra we have the piano certainly in full view but along the ridges of the front row we have other musicians and so the attempt was always to have sound with film this goes back to edison and it wouldn't be the written it wouldn't be the spoken word but there would be at least musical accompaniment sometimes there would be um sound effects and so on to help augment what was being seen but before we go on to talk about the changeover into synchronized amplified sound i want to make some distinctions between acting for the stage and acting for the screen we'll start with stage acting because it's the oldest form of acting and one of the uh, characteristics is that every performance is basically full in other words you begin with the beginning of the play you end with the end of the play and you do it in one afternoon or evening and actors really appreciate that sometimes that ability to do an entire play not just work on for example with film one scene for a week or two or an even longer so to be able to kind of finish off the arc of the character within a single performance is one difference another would be that you're acting before an audience and so you would get that immediate feedback the thrill of performing to a live audience and the possible dangers that can erupt as well if the audience begins reacting badly also in theater you have to really project your voice you have to act a bit larger than life speak a bit larger than life and more recently particularly with these mega shows like the lion king and others they'll mic the character so they don't have to speak to a huge auditorium that holds say 500 a thousand people but there's still an element of projection involved and also because people in the back row have to understand movement you have to use more gestural acting in other words you have to do what they were doing in the tableaus the films that we were seeing for example like uncle tom's cabin where you really have to kind of project your body language as well also you have to memorize your lines you don't have the benefit of cue cards you don't have a, pro a teleprompter you don't you're not just going over one line of dialogue you've got to basically memorize the whole play so if you make a mistake then somebody's got to cover and i say oops but somebody has to cover there are no redos in theater screen acting on the other hand you don't shoot in chronological order so you might actually begin shooting the last scene of the film first which is kind of odd because you're 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 not really fully in character oftentimes yet and so you're shooting out of chronological order and sometimes as i alluded to earlier for weeks like stanley kubrick for example was notorious for having people go over and over and over the same scene until he felt they got it right so 
as opposed to one evening, shooting a film goes on for months before you get a complete performance, and then it goes into the editing process. Instead of acting for an audience, you're acting basically for a camera and the crew, who is not paying for their tickets, but being paid. Also, the acting is very much down, less broad, very subtle. When you get in for close-ups, a tear can be like a river. A slight quiver of the lip can speak volumes. And of course, in the theater, you can't see that. Even in the front row, it's difficult to see that. So you have to play down because your head is going to be about a hundred times bigger than it is in real life. And every gesture you make is going to be seen in a close-up by the whole audience without a problem. So in film, if you make a mistake, cut, try it again. No problem. There's there's no need to cover. There's no need to memorize lines. And so you have the benefit of editing to help you in your performance. And as I said before, some directors ins insist on having many takes. So in a, in a scene from The Shining, for example, that was alluded to in an earlier Ed Puzzle, there was Shelley Duvall is being confronted by the Jack Nicholson character, and there were literally 70 takes of that scene. So Wendy, who is terrorized by Jack, isn't really acting, some would argue, at that point. And so it can be really a, a grueling and repetitious process. So finally, there's no feedback from the audience. And what feedback there is when the film is finally released, you don't get. So those are the, the major differences between film and acting for the stage. And so I want to move on to talk a little bit about how sound coming to film really mixed things up for a while. For now, I, I want to focus on what impact the addition of amplified sound, amplified synchronized sound, had upon the cinematic experience and what you see here is a studio set and with cameras out. But basically, it was discovered pretty quickly that when you recorded sound at the, in the studio, you picked up the camera as well, which was quite noisy. So these boxes that you see here are all soundproof booths that would, the door would close and you can see the window here. And here's another window through which the projector, the projectionist would be able to film the proceedings. And basically, it was impossible to cut because you were, you were recording at the same time. And it was impossible to really move the camera. So all of that visual vocabulary of movement got lost. And for, for a short period of time, until a device was invented to soundproof the camera, you got these really static films that were released to the public, but the huge acclaim because we were finally able to hear the voice of Al Jolson, for example. So this is a projector. This gentleman here is holding the sound device, which looks an awful lot like a vinyl record. It happens to be made out of wax. There it is in the close-up. And the first film that was released in synchronized sound was The Jazz Singer. But basically, The Jazz Singer was a silent film with music added and an occasional random word or two from the actor. And I'll, and I'll show you a clip. It's not a very good film, I don't think, and I don't really like Al Jolson. But it'll give you a sense of how these early films were sort of static. Listen, I'm going to sing this like I will if I go on the stage, you know, with this show. I'm going to sing it jazzy. Now get this. Blue sky, smiling at me, 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 me. Nothing but little blue sky, do I see? Do, 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 do. Blue bird, singing a song. Nothing but little blue bird, all day long. You like that slapping business? Never saw the sun, shining so bright. Never saw things going so right. Noticing the day, hurrying by. 
when you're in love, oh, don't they fly? Blue day, all of them gone, nothing but... Just quickly, I'd like to show you one more quick clip from this period. This is 1928. This is The Lights of New York, and this is the first all-talking film. And so all the dialogue was delivered by microphone. And the microphone is hidden in plain sight. It's in the telephone in the image. And you can see from watching this how everything just becomes dead. Small tilts, small pans, but the acting has just gone flat as everything relents to speaking. Now we've got to cover ourselves up. I've planted the stuff in Eddie's shop. Yeah? And the dicks will be there at 10 o'clock. Uh-huh. But they must not find Eddie. Don't you understand? What you mean? Take him for a ride. Oh. Of course, it didn't take long for Hollywood to solve some of these aesthetic problems by getting rid of the sound of the camera. And what we have here is a blimp. And a blimp is basically a simple encasement that puts the camera in what amounts to be this multiple suitcase like device which will muffle the sound so the piece on top will close over the reels the piece on the bottom will close up to cover most of the motor and the piece in front will cover both the motor and the sound coming from the lens which was really minimal it was the motor we had to worry about Another aesthetic problem was, so was solved by getting rid of the records, the two system, two system sound where you had a record playing simultaneous to the image and by recording sound directly onto film. And so here you see an image of 35 millimeter film with the soundtrack on the left. And here you can see a blow up of the soundtrack. So it gets rather technical. We won't get into it. Uh, well, you might a little bit when we talk about sound after editing, but um, this kind of led us into the era that really actors became incredibly popular. And this is the studio system era from about 1930 to 1955. And you will remember, of course, that stars and personalities from the movies were incredibly popular before this time but this time it came it by by the 30s it had become really a factory like system and basically actors would sign contracts with the studios and once they did they had pretty much their rights as an artist removed they the studios would decide what films the actors would appear in. Sometimes they'd even rent out the actors for higher fees to other studios. They had control over their public lives, their social lives, their names even. So, for example, Marion Morrison became John Wayne, and uh, Leroy Shearer became Rock Hudson, and Norma Jean Morrison became Marilyn Monroe, so on and so forth. And the studios basically decided what the names would be. So once signed, actors would train at the studio where they were tested in films. They would do screen tests, which were basically uh, an attempt to see what the actor looked like and sounded like on film. And it's often different from what they look like and sound like in reality. And so 
testing them out for particular roles and so forth. And they would be trained in all sorts of things, as you'll see momentarily, in terms of dancing and walking and et cetera, et cetera. And so among these stars, after they've gone through the ranks of all of this work, uh, some would become major and people whose fake social lives were really well documented. So before, when you went to a movie in the 40s and 50s, there would be newsreels and included in those newsreels would be stories about stars, which were usually made up. People were famous like uh, Luella Parsons, for example, and Hedda Hopper, these tremendously readed, readed, read <laughs> celebrity columnists, and their their daily newspaper stories were, as I said, very popular and highly read, even though the stories were largely fake. And so even though the stars, the actors were owned by the studios, they were compensated by big paychecks. So I want to take just a few moments and look at a clip from a film about the studio system and the nurturing of stars. Hope you enjoy. The celebrities include Joan Crawford. Hey, come back here, Joan. And here's Richard Green arriving with Wendy Berry. Well, in the um, so-called golden age of Hollywood, studios certainly did control the image of stars very strongly. They determined what films they would make, uh, how that would be advertised, what they would wear, what stories about them would be got over to the press and so on. So in that sense, they, they controlled the image very strongly indeed. We would bring two people together that worked at the studio and uh, insist that they date each other and send a photographer along and a, uh, and a reporter from a fan magazine along on the date. They went along with it. They did the fake dates one a week, once a week if they wanted to. Then they went out and took opium, <laughs> you know, and did whatever they did on the side. And nobody would report that as long as they'd play the game, as long as they'd talk to Hedda and Luella and mouth the stuff that they wanted to hear, they would leave them alone if they did the other stuff. The fan magazines were fanny wanny. They catered to the children, to the uh, teenagers, and to people who, uh, who wanted to love these dream people. Mm, oh, boy. Darling, how I love you, my darling. I love you, I do. And they did not allow uh, any photograph of anyone with a glass in their hand. It might have just been orange juice, but it might be misinterpreted because they never drank and they never smoked and they never screwed. Oh, in the old Hollywood pictures, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't have babies when they weren't married. They couldn't be gay. They couldn't take drugs. They couldn't do anything, basically. They had to live this fake life. But the publicity department took care of that. If they had a life that wasn't acceptable, they dreamed up a fake life for them. And the press knew it was fake, but they reported it. It was completely a rigged game in the old days. Here's what it's like inside the cabin of the luxurious airliner. Normally speaking, there isn't really too much news in Hollywood, and it has to be manufactured. If I had to guess how many stories were written and planted a year, I would say 20 or 30 a day times 365. Must be getting near the big village. Paulette's putting on her war paint. It was as important uh, to the studio that they do the publicity as it was that they stand up in front of the cameras and act. Being a star, they eventually could never go out of your house. You can never have a good love affair. All the things that most people want, you have to give up if you become that famous, and they gladly do it. Your first lesson with me, first thing I want to see you do is walk. The heel of the foot comes down first, and then onto the ball of the foot, like that. of you know what was wrong? No. So it's your posture. I'm going to have Virginia Gray, a young featured player, show you the correct way of walking, 
sitting down, going up the stairs and coming down again. We had what amounted to a finishing school on the lot. We had a uh, drama school and they went to school regularly and uh, finally they became uh, good enough so that they were turned over to directors and used on movies. Despite what might seem like heavy Hollywood control over its actors and the films it made, and even the theaters it owned, a good number of really great films were produced during this period, including the one we're looking at here, Casablanca, and here, Gone with the Wind, and here, Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn in Bringing Up Baby, all making use of, of stars like Errol Flynn in the original 1939 Robin Hood, and here with Gene Kelly in the musical, which of course was vitalized by the idea of sound in film. A new genre was in fact born. But something was going on in New York on the opposite coast, and people were coming to this old church and meeting together to talk about acting. And from this was born method acting in the United States. Now, method acting has its origins in Russia from Stanislavski and to condense what was really a pretty elaborate system of acting into a few lines. You have here that actors should develop both body and voice, should have techniques for moving around the stage, and this sounds kind of oxymoronic, that are both studied and realistic. Actors should be observers of reality. This is, this is where we start getting into what act, uh, method acting is most known for. They should develop an interconnection with the part they are portraying. And they should thoroughly analyze the script and give up the illusion of action as it occurs. Uh, and so the idea that actors strive for perfection by in part becoming or internalizing those feelings similar to what a character would have. And so method acting was born in the U.S. in 1947 on 45th Street in New York. And the people who came out of the actor's studio were, in fact, a new breed. And in terms of what happened in that studio in New York, you would find exercises in improvisation. So you would be given a character and something to do, something that you hadn't studied for. You would, and this is of course similar to the Stanislavski method, try to get in touch with emotions within yourself or experiences that evoke emotions within yourself that are similar to the character's emotional state. You would try to understand why a character is doing something. You would try to understand a character's history. And so there's a lot of thought that goes into method acting. A lot of emotional work that goes into method acting. And so part of that work would include studying people who live lives similar to those of the characters. So hanging out with cops, for example, or hanging out as Marlon Brando did with dock workers and boxers, or hanging out with people who have autism as Dustin Hoffman did for Rain Man, and, and, and studying those characters so that you could try to really be, work from within. So you work from within, out inward, outward, and and remain in that character even while you're off screen. And we've all heard stories of Heath Ledger and others who have suffered the consequences of, of method acting. But I think, frankly, Heath Ledger's story is a bit overblown. He was, in fact, making another film after Batman that was much lighter in character. But in any case, people like Marlon Brando People like Marilyn Monroe and Montgomery Cliff and people like James Dean were beginning to find their way on screen. And people were mesmerized by these people. They had a charisma and a magnetism that 
drew the audience to these films. And so I want to stop again, and I'm going to look at a, an improvisational exercise. This, this is an improvisational exercise in waiting. So, and he's, the actor has been given a prop, a suitcase. Of course, today we just pull out our cell phones if we were waiting, right? But he's got several minutes in which to work through this waiting, and then he's going to be critiqued. So part of method acting is to be critiqued by your teacher, and sometimes supported, of course, by your teacher and other students. And you're going to hear Uta Hagen, who was a prime teacher at the method acting studio in New York, and who in fact starred in films herself. So let's take a look at this moment of improvisational acting and critique. Okay, now how did you feel? Uh, pretty good. It was pretty good. It's yeah. amazing for a first one. Uh, if anything, if you would criticize anything, what it would be in your selection? Um, well, and one technical thing about difficulties, I let the readers that, but I don't, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you had enough to do so that you're almost avoiding the problem. Ah, okay, yeah. Right? right. So you select less activities and see how the interesting thing when this exercise, where well, you could have gone on another five minutes, couldn't you? And it wouldn't have bothered least, you. Right. That's what was good about it. And when it's correct, we feel fully occupied if we know where we are, what we're doing there, what we're wearing, where, we, where we're going, where we came from. And when I say what we're wearing, how the clothing influences how you stand. If you had on shoes that were too tight or a, um, an evening jacket or an evening shirt, you would, uh, for going someplace fancy, you would behave quite differently. Isn't that true? Sure. And those are the considerations w why this is a little bit easier to do here in this exercise than it is on stage, is that when we're on stage in a problem like this, we are wearing a costume instead of our own clothes. We haven't endowed them with a reality so that they belong to us. We very often are spare on inner objects that come from the given circumstances, which are different for, for the character in the play than they would be for you. And uh, so that it's more difficult to execute on the stage. But the principle of it remains the same. You didn't give yourself enough room in between when you were caught by an inner consideration of something that had happened, something that will happen, what you're going to do when you get there. And you can be caught by an inner object that produces thought where you can be totally still for quite a while. Right. And when it wears out for you, then you go to an outer object again. Uh, give yourself more inner objects and more room to deal with them instead of always going from activity to activity. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Just a word about the critique, something Uta Hagen said, and the idea of internal objects. And that's the idea of thinking and emotion that during the course of our day just weaves itself in and out of our minds. And for the most part, we don't act on them. We, we would look externally relatively flat, but her critique was that he seemed to be acting on them. Ooh, wallet, check it out. And so the acting was, as she said, avoiding the problem 
of waiting. So interesting, and I think possibly useful critique there. I, I want to take a look just before we close off on some of the extremes in terms of physical rigor that method acting might involve. And here we have, of course, Christian Bale in three different roles, the mechanic, Batman, and from the big short, where he uh, first lost a lot of weight, then beefed up, and then put on weight to play this um, character. Here we have Hilary Swank, who won an Academy Award for Million Dollar Baby, studied boxing, who tried to do to, to rigorously study boxing. And you probably heard about Natalie Portman in The Black Swan, um, who, who perhaps studied to excess. Uh, Hilary Swank, a little more moderate, but again, a very intense and believable performance. Robert De Niro earlier, another boxing film where he both beefed up for the young Jake LaMotta, the boxer, and then got kind of beefed up in a different way for the older Jake LaMotta. So put on 50 pounds after he had lost all this weight to play LaMotta in his prime. Um, this is uh, Charlize Therzan. I always get her name mispronounced. So, um, who's playing Eileen Warnos, a serial killer who actually in real life um, was a serial killer in Texas, or Florida, rather, and killed seven men. And she really studied the role and took on the characteristics of this woman who had been filmed by a British documentary filmmaker and to get into the role tried to become her. So oftentimes this gets really unpleasant, obviously. And I think of people like Jake Liegenhall and uh, in Nightcrawlers and Heath Ledger, I mentioned before from The Dark Knight. So it, it's really putting yourself on the line emotionally sometimes. So if you're interested, you can find more, of course, by, by looking more carefully at the textbook and going online. I just want to mention synthespians. It's a word that combines synthetic and thespian. And perhaps the most famous thin, sin thespian is Andy Circus, who is here shown with his motion capture, capture suit on the left-hand side of the frame and his transformation into the lead ape for Planet of the Apes. Circus has also been in Star Wars films. He played Gollum in several Lord of the Rings films and The Hobbit and so on. And so really quite interesting in terms of, I, I suppose, a way of animating with actual human beings that doesn't involve rotoscoping. But Circus has definitely taken it to an art, and he's really quite expressive with his body. So I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Film 101. I hope you're well, and be sure to email me if you have any questions. Take care.